I am a beta. 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 In November 1999, under the chairmanship of Chris Mikowski, the Epsilon Gamma Alumni Association recognized that in a few short years, Epsilon Gamma would own the chapter house. Looking ahead, the question was posed, what should we do next? It was Chris Mikowski, who is the Alumni Association president, who asked Ken Breen, one of our great beta brothers, to review the best practices of the fraternity system uh, to review what the wants and needs were of our alums and undergraduates, of parents, and really come up with a strategic direction that we could follow basically for the next 20 years. Breen spent 11 months gathering information and processing the information into a summary report. All in all, he just spent pretty close to a year just assembling just an, an ungodly amount of data. What started out as a simple bricks and mortar initiative evolved into something far more dynamic. The further Epsilon Gamma got into this project, the more it became clear that a fraternity house must be built on a firm foundation, and the foundation had nothing to do with bricks and mortar. Rather, a firm foundation had everything to do with having clearly defined goals for the Epsilon Gamma organization. On October 28, 2000, the strategic planning report was adopted as a roadmap for Epsilon Gamma. To really focus our attention on advising the chapter, running the corporation, and providing uh, the long-term endowments for scholarships, for leadership development activities, uh, while maintaining a relationship opportunity and, a, and an opportunity to build relationships within our alumni ranks. Based on a recommendation from the report, the Epsilon Gamma Alumni Association and the Epsilon Gamma Housing Corporation were merged into a single governing body. For two organizations that were operating simultaneously, there weren't enough bodies, there weren't enough people who could be involved and actively contribute. So what we thought we would do is combine resources, make one real strong, good group, and uh, just move forward. We have found since that we've been able to fill our board, maintain a high quality of activity for our alumni through the pig roast, through the homecoming activities, and our annual golf outing. And we're more financially sound than we've ever been. On November 11, 2000, Epsilon Gamma alumni and guests enjoyed a fun-filled evening at the Comfort Inn in Mount Pleasant for the chapter's 15th anniversary. Founding father Tom Bussineau chaired the event. But all was not right with Epsilon Gamma several warning signs of trouble began to appear. Externally, the fraternity world was changing. Fraternities changed in the 90s because they were forced to change. There was a different culture being created on college campuses where the expectation for academic achievement was higher. Uh, if something wasn't done to reverse the trends, like uh, decline in membership from 8,000 undergraduates down to 6,000 undergraduates, and some 50 plus chapters on an annual basis were experiencing risk management incidents. Only 48% of our chapters were even above the all men's average on campus. We weren't even average. If the Greek life continued as it was in the 90s, that there weren't, would not be any more fraternities or sororities on campus. And in order for the fraternity system to stay relevant, we had to change our tactics as well. Sure, we're going to focus on social activities, we're going to have a good time, we're going to develop ourselves as friends and brothers, but we're also going to develop as leaders and scholars. In early 2002, following a risk management violation and a university investigation, the chapter was placed on probationary status through the spring of 2004. Sanctions included the prohibition of social, athletic, and recruitment activities. When you start to see multiple mistakes made without the accountability and the university begins to take notice of your organization, not for the things that at one point in time made your group uh, an outstanding chapter on campus, but you start to be recognized for violations of code and things of that nature, you really have to step back and evaluate why you have a chapter. The stipulation was added that any future violations of the student code of conduct would result in the removal of campus recognition. Beta Theta Pi would not be allowed to return to the campus in the foreseeable future. Drastic action would be necessary to preserve the long-term viability of the organization. When the university told us it would no longer tolerate stereotypical fraternity behaviors, we had to change our course of action. You're talking about 
making a decision for 200 plus men that had come before you that all have an opinion and an idea of what they would expect and how things should go. After exhaustive information gathering and opinion outreach to the entire chapter, the directors and advisors voted unanimously to close the chapter. It was decided that instead of trying to operate on a skeleton crew for two years of suspension from recruitment activities, athletic activities, and social activities, our only true option was to close down for two years with a return agreement with the university that would allow us to come back. It really tore me up. It it was one of the toughest things that I had to do. And I know there were some questions about it at the time that it happened. It basically had to be done that way, otherwise we wouldn't have been successful anyway. And it wasn't easy for me because I started the chapter. I was here at the beginning and I built it up. And it wasn't an easy decision to say, hey, we need to close, close down. It was really the only decision that we could make because uh, um, I, I don't know about anybody else, but um, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to risk seeing it go away forever. The decision was announced to undergraduate members on Tuesday, March 26, 2002 in Mount Pleasant. I saw the look on Tom over his face when he was talking to, to the undergraduates. It tore him up, it tore me up, and it wasn't an easy task to do. It was a rough period. Two years, no actives, no homecomings, no activities at the house. It was tough for me because I had finally decided to become involved and I wanted to be able to come back to the fraternity, homecomings and everything else and help make it what it was for me. The chapter closing, it, it was like a piece of me being taken away. There was no more house to go to. Ten years we had seven citizens and I, I didn't understand the events that led up to it but I was deeply hurt. And depressed and sad. Being there towards some of those last couple of years and seeing that things were kind of heading into a direction we didn't really want them to head in, uh, I wasn't surprised. Um, but that doesn't mean I wasn't disappointed. Hindsight's always, you know, 2020. You, you, you find out what was good, what was bad, and uh, I think we learned a big lesson from it. And it's going to make us stronger in the end. We have a chance for a fresh start, to regain our identity, to, to reestablish Epsilon Gamma as um, the, you know, one of the premier chapters of Beta Theta Pi. Ironically, the house was paid off weeks later, yet years of wear and tear had taken its toll. During the summer of 2002, the second floor and the exterior of the house were thoroughly renovated under the leadership of Epsilon Gamma Housing Corporation President Tom Olver and Vice President Bill Adler. The decision to renovate the house came about as a result of Ken Breen's work on the strategic plan. We were faced with a house that really needed a facelift. And there were just things that the city recognized um, as hazards. We decided to move ahead and renovate our existing structure so that we had a saleable product for somebody to live in so we could eventually put our new members, our young undergraduates, back in the house. Epsilon Gamma alumni, the Epsilon Gamma Housing Corporation, and the general fraternity immediately began planning for the return of the chapter to the CMU campus in the fall of 2004. I think it was important to have a bit of a relationship with some of the university administrators, and by building up some credibility there, uh, we were able to have those tough discussions about why Beta Theta Pi should be let back on Central Michigan University's campus. It was incredibly tough, but we negotiated through the Dean of Students office and uh, our Greek advisor, and they were able to give us a second chance. And we're glad for it. When I found out the chapter was coming back, I was really excited because I knew that it wasn't coming back in any way that any of us have ever known. Um, but what's so exciting about that is Beta's initiative to head into the future of what a fraternity should be. Well, I think the Beta Theta Pi of today does all the things that Beta Theta Pi has always done, lifelong friendship opportunities and opportunities to, to work with the group, but today we have the added opportunities of leadership development and personal development which have really brought Beta Theta Pi to the fore in the fraternal world. You're creating a more responsible fraternity based on values and behaviors. And with those values and behaviors in place, the men of principle will offer a great alternative to the 
stereotypical paternity life. And it's made all the difference. It has reversed the trend of declining membership numbers. It has increased our alumni involvement, our reputation on campuses, and our expansion to uh, dormant chapters and new universities. So going forward with Beta Theta Pi, we've, we've set the trend, we've set the example that other fraternities and sororities will follow for years to come. We're going to start this chapter over again, and they don't know anything of the old EG. The proud history and things that you want to insert back into the culture, that's appropriate. The message of Mentor Principal is what we're going to be recruiting on. The feelings I had when I heard that the chapter was coming back, it was great excitement. I kind of had, you know, 2004 circled on my calendar, talked about it a lot with family and friends. I knew that I wanted to put as much effort into it so that this could be a successful return. An advising team was formed under the direction of David Steiner and founding father Greg Compton. We've got a new foundation and we've got the right type of foundation just a shining example for what a fraternity can be on that campus. We were a strong chapter, a proud chapter, and we should be right there again. We're, we're not only trying to you know, build these leaders of tomorrow, but we're trying to break away from a lot of the old stereotypes that were in the past. And uh, it's the kind of thing where if you don't do it right, then you know, our success is going to be significantly hampered. In the fall of 2004, the fraternity's director of expansion, David Ray, British Columbia 2000, led the recruitment efforts to bring Beta Theta Pi back to CMU's campus. With the help of education consultant Vito Brandel, St. Louis 04, the effort was successful. First few days on campus were uh, a whirlwind. We would have nine hour days just sitting by the table and uh, explaining to everybody that, you know, asking, you wanna go Beta? You wanna go for it? Well, at first I was, you know, I was a, GDI, and uh, I didn't want anything to do with, with a fraternity or sorority or any of that stuff. I didn't really have any intention of joining a fraternity, but I uh, got to see what it was all about and how different it is and really found out what Beta was about. I, I couldn't pass it up. I joined looking for leadership opportunities, and I, I thought that I could learn things during my college years from Beta that, that the college could not teach me. On the 22nd day of the first month of 2005, six earnest young men were initiated on the roles of the Epsilon Gamma chapter of Beta Theta Pi. When we finally went down to Oxford and got initiated, it wasn't that that was the final stepping stone, but that was what brought us together. Everything just came together at that point and making me realize what I really wanted to do and why I joined Beta. Being on one knee in the Hall of Chapters was one of the most refreshing and eye-opening experiences of my life and getting to know the men that I live with and associate myself with better on a daily basis continues to make my life more complete. The chapter regained its title as best academic fraternity on campus in its first semester back on campus. The next semester, four more men joined the roles of the Epsilon Gamma chapter, including Brandel just pure joy and excitement when the guys were nice enough to give me uh, my own EG role number uh, of which I'm very proud to have. Uh, I wasn't really actually looking to join a fraternity and these guys got me uh, involved a little bit with the recruitment through scholarship. The guys are awesome so I mean I, I, that's why I joined. During the summer of 2005 the house at 814 South Main Street underwent a massive interior renovation under the watchful eye of Phil Adler. The entire membership of the undergraduate chapter moved into the house to begin the fall 2005 semester. The first year was a lot of work, um, but the high points to the work is knowing that you're working hard for it to pay off, and it's paying off right now, me sitting at this counter in the house, because that's what we all work for, is living together. The house is immaculate. It's a, a different house. Um, it's a lot brighter. Three years ago it was just a dark house, but it's more livable, it's brighter. I was blown away when I first got into the house. It was just remarkable. Seeing what it was last year into what it was becoming this year, I, I couldn't wait to move in and start living in this house. The alums have been absolutely fabulous and I want to thank all of them because without them, we were a bunch of chickens with our heads cut off, honestly. We're so lucky to have the people we had donate time and money just 
to help us. And I mean, we really are truly blessed.